Welcome to the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Dr. Terry Schrader. With us today is Dr. Francis Collins, Director of the National Human Genome Research Institute at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Collins co-authored a perspective article in the June 19th issue of the New England Journal of Medicine about the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008. Welcome, Dr. Collins. Nice to be here. Tell us exactly what the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA, stipulates. So yeah, let's call it GINA because it's a lot of syllables. Uh, this is a wonderful milestone. Basically, this bill says that it is not legal anymore to have genetic information about individuals used to discriminate against them in health insurance or in the workplace. We're particularly concerned about the predictive genetic information that increasingly people have a chance to find out about themselves but which has caused them some anxieties about who else is going to know this and what's going to happen. So the goal of the bill is to make it safe to learn those things about yourself without fear that it will somehow be used against you. As the person responsible for mapping the human genome, why did you feel so strongly that we needed an anti-discrimination act? I came to NIH in 1993. The Genome Project was just getting off the ground. One of the things I'm proudest of about the Genome Project was that we incorporated research on the ethical, legal, and social implications of this science as part of the project, the so-called ELSI program, E-L-S-I. And early on, this issue of genetic discrimination was identified as one of the highest priorities. We all agree that we don't get to pick our DNA. Uh, why should it therefore be reasonable to have it used against you? This is an issue of equity, an issue of justice. In a certain way, it's a civil rights issue. And yet, there were no protections uh, at that point that would make this safe for people. Many of the states decided to act on that, and many states have passed bills. But having a patchwork of protections across the US where depending on which particular state you were in, determined whether or not it was safe to learn this stuff. That didn't seem quite right. A federal solution seemed to be needed. And so we got started, but that was a long, long path. 13 years. 13 years ago, the first bill was introduced in 1995 by Congresswoman Slaughter of New York, who's one of the heroes of this story because she stuck with it through thick and thin. And 13 years ago, uh, that bill got very little attention and was judged to have almost no chance uh, of ever coming through. There are 1,500 conditions that are uh, now sort of illuminated, one can say, by different genetic tests. Is it true that people are reluctant to get those genetic tests really based on the fear of discrimination? Absolutely. Take breast cancer, for instance. It's now been quite a, a while that we've had tests for individuals with a very strong family history of breast and ovarian cancer, where it is likely that mutations in the genes called BRCA1 or BRCA2 might be at work. It is clear from the research that's been done over the last 15 years that knowing you're in that situation and have a high risk can be quite beneficial in terms of taking actions to reduce your risk. Similarly, for colon cancer, we know of specific mutations that place some people with a strong family history at very high risk, and it's possible to determine that much more precisely with a DNA test. But many people have been afraid to take advantage of that because of this fear of discrimination, either in health insurance or maybe in their job, that their employer might find out and decide not to promote you or maybe give you a pink slip. So you can show quite clearly uh, from the evidence that people are doing strange things to try to avoid that risk. Lots of people using assumed names uh, to have genetic tests done, telling their doctors, don't put that in my medical record, even asking their doctors to lie about whether the test has been done or not, just to try to protect themselves against something that would be unjust. What a crazy situation. It's a good thing we are fixing that. What should physicians know specifically about Gina? I think one of the important points uh, that physicians should be aware of is that this bill does not constrain them at all. In fact, in many ways, it frees them up to practice good medicine. Physicians are entirely free to take a good family history, to recommend a genetic test, uh, to know about the result of that, uh, to handle that in the way they would other parts of the medical record. It is now less risky for that information to be in the medical record. How will the act impact clinical research almost immediately? Right now, clinical research is actually having trouble recruiting individuals for programs that involve genetic testing because people have been afraid to have that part done. Even with all the reassurances about trying to keep the research records private, people were fearful that somehow it would leak into their medical record and they'd lose their health insurance. 
and a third of patients who've been asked to sign on to some of these protocols to look at genetic testing and how it could be used for medical benefit have refused after they've learned of this risk. We're very hopeful that's all now going to turn around and people who are interested will feel they can go forward without that fear. Don't insurance companies already um, compute genetic risk, so to speak, based on relatives with the disease, mm -hmm. and will Gina stop that? In the past, that has been the case. Family history has been used uh, to do underwriting. Gina basically says you can't do that anymore. Family history is certainly genetic information. And you can imagine that if family history was still allowed, then if you had a positive BRCA1 test, a company could say, well, we weren't using the test, we're using the fact that your mother had breast cancer and we would have not provided the protection at all. So this is a major step forward. And there's a message here also that's worth paying attention to. That means family history is both safe uh, to be used uh, for medical care and we should probably be paying more attention to its value. It is genetic information and it's free. You don't have to go to a fancy uh, laboratory <laughs> to have your family history determined. What are the penalties that come under GINA? So for the health insurance uh, risks, if an insurer were to do something uh, that is seen as discriminatory, then the uh, complainant would go through the EEOC uh, following the same pathway that is done uh, for civil rights issues, and those are well worked out in terms of comparisons to previous legislation, but over the next 12 months, the Department of Health and Human Services will be writing up the regulations about exactly how to proceed. Uh, for employers in Title II of the bill, uh, there's a separate set of penalties that include monetary uh, charges uh, against an employer who takes this kind of action and who can be shown to have done it intentionally. Are there any limitations to GINA and how would you like to see it broadened? GINA is a very good bill and it took a long time to get it into this frame because there are many issues here that had to be wrestled with to be sure we were providing protections but not doing damage to the health insurance industry or putting employers in a bad spot. One of the concerns was whether this would inspire frivolous lawsuits by people who hadn't really been, dis been discriminated against but who thought maybe they could get something out of this approach. I think the bill is very carefully crafted uh, to avoid that kind of mischief. But it doesn't cover uh, some of the other discriminatory areas that people have worried about, which in fact are going to be more difficult. What about long-term care? Uh, what about disability insurance? What about life insurance? Those are not covered by GINA. Those are circumstances where one can make a more compelling case uh, that a company who's providing the insurance can't really be kept in the dark about an individual's risk, otherwise you have an adverse selection situation. Health insurance doesn't seem to operate that way, but life, long-term care, and disability do. So maybe in the longer term, we could come up with a way of dealing with that issue by allowing some sort of floor of basic protection, no questions asked. But if somebody wants to buy a $20 million life insurance policy, it's going to be pretty hard to say that they could know something about their genetic future and not tell the company that's being asked uh, to cover them. That's going to be tougher. And finally, how will we know that GINA is working and that it's enough? We're going to need to watch closely over the coming years to see whether GINA has succeeded, as we hope it will, in preventing mischief. And one way to track that, of course, is to see are people bringing cases where they feel that they have been mistreated, and if so, how are those being adjudicated? But another is to ask, are people now feeling like they can use their own name when they have a breast cancer gene test? Are they feeling like they can put that information in their medical record and not hide it? And we can track those things as well. And certainly the disease advocates who've worked so hard to see this happen are going to be watching on our behalf and letting us know whether this in fact has provided that kind of reassurance that people have been looking for. Thank you very much, Dr. Collins. Thank you. It's great to be here.